Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Kathy Kramer, President and CEO of St. Joseph's Foundation and the Barrow Neurological Foundation. St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in Phoenix is the largest hospital in the Dignity Health System, previously known as Catholic Healthcare West. And the Barrow Neurological Institute performs more brain surgeries than any other institution in the United States. Kathy was previously the Foundation's Vice President of Leadership Gifts, as well as an individual giving officer at Mayo Clinic. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Healthcare is such an enormous topic in the United States today, and the need is both uh, high and growing, and the expenses are high and growing, particularly for high interventionist medicine. Surgeries certainly um, are, are very expensive to perform. Could you talk about how you triangulate between the need out there and the means to fund that need? Well, there's always more, more needs than there's money available for. So what we try to do is prioritize the activities that we'll look to seek funds for. And with the reimbursement of health care expenses dramatically dropping, we find that our charity care has gone through the roof. And so we balance both our culture of taking care of everyone, the sick and in, in disenfranchised, as well as the very wealthy. And so what we try to do is maintain our culture that the Sisters of Mercy brought to the Valley and to St. Joseph's 118 years ago. Our foundations is based on generous gifts from grateful patients. Uh, about 95% of the money we raise annually comes from people who have utilized our services and they're happy for their care or they've lost a loved one and they want to make sure that nobody else goes through the hor horrific uh, struggles they went through with a particular disease. So in the neurology area, people with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, brain tumors, any of those things, uh, a variety of people don't want to see anybody else have to suffer through with those. You have people with means and people without means. You have simultaneously a facility that has a very high cost to maintain and certainly to maintain the excellence that you represent. How does that play itself out in terms of the care that is given or does it not play itself out in the way the care is given? It doesn't play itself out the way care is given. Um, everybody is given the best quality. It's the patient-centered focus, so the best quality of health care that's available. Um, our foundations are, exist to support charity care, uh, ongoing research, uh, clinical excellence, mm -hmm. education of our physicians, our nurses. We have a residency training program. We train more neurosurgeons in the world than any other place. So we try to balance the priorities, and like I said before, the, the needs are always greater than what we can raise. So there is no means test. No. You, you accept people at the door. Yes, we do. And you provide identical services. Yes. Then you have the other side, which is uh, funding, which you do receive from uh, insurance companies from mm -hmm. patients, but you also um, receive contributions. You talked about the fact that most of your contributions come from people who have experienced your care. So they're helping others who they might never know. That's exactly right. I think it comes to, they come to a point when they find that they need to leave a legacy. And you can only spend so much money, so you could have a whole lot of money and after you, you've stopped accumulating or you're still accumulating wealth, you want to do something good with your life, especially if you've been ill. And we find that people really find that spirituality when they go through a, a devastating disease or a heart attack or anything that, that changes their world as they know it. So for instance, we have a couple who are in their 80s and they have more money than they know what to do with, and they can buy whatever they want for each other. And they ran out of things to buy for each other. And so on their anniversary, their 50th, 50th anniversary, they dedicated the healing garden, uh, gave a gift so that other patients that need to go out and, and connect with 
their spirituality while they're going through some bad times. And so they gave each other a healing garden for their anniversary. It places you in a very sensitive position when you are trying to um, help people to invest in a cause in which you believe, mm -hmm. in which they believe, and which they have experienced. But they've also had their own experiences with being chased by nonprofit organizations asking for donations. How do you, on the one hand, take into account the human side of your interactions with people, but also uh, ensure that you hit your marks? Because every year, this institution requires a certain amount of funding to continue to the next year. You have a business obligation mm -hmm. to pursue. But then there's also the human side of of affording someone the time, the space, um, the dialogue that is required so that they would be comfortable if they decide to make a gift. Mm -hmm. Well, we're in the relationship business and manage all the people that work in my shop manage a portfolio of about 150 relationships and we're matchmakers. So not every year do people continue to make those big gifts, but you know when they're ready, you've listened to them, you hear what interests them, you might find something that's a perfect fit for them, and that's when those gifts come in. So it's just about being involved and listening and knowing what their families are like and, and building on that relationship, and you become a part of their family. Do your donors see this as an investment or do they see it as charity? An investment. And what are they investing in? Are they investing in, in somebody else's life or are they investing in? A cure. A cure? A cure, um, a way that medicine is delivered differently um, in a, a family friendly space, if it's capital, um, whatever their interests are in. So this particular couple that I talked about with the healing garden that was very, all their children and grandchildren had been born at St. Joe's and so they they wanted to be able to have their families and their generations continue to go to a place that had a healing environment to a hospital that they were very connected to. And in many respects they're investing in the future. That's exactly it's, right. It, it's no different than investing in your children's future, your community's future, um, in, in future income but right. instead of receiving a financial return, you're, you're receiving a different type of return, aren't you? That's exactly right. So if you, you know, one of our biggest um, celebrities, I would say, that uh, helps us is Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad Ali has Parkinson's. And he gets his care at our facility, and he lends his name to our facility and raises money for us, uh, probably to the tune of about $20 million we've received since he uh, lent his name to us about 14 years ago. And his investment is because he, he knows what it's like to live with this disease, and he knows what it's like to be able to manage it and to have those resources available for everybody who has Parkinson's. It's not a question of how, um, what your social status is or your, it, it, it affects you. And so in the treatment of that, new discoveries are made, and those discoveries are going to help you as a patient, but also future patients. That's exactly right. So motor skills are one thing that you lose when you have Parkinson's, and we have a gem that was donated by yet another Parkinson's patient that helps them physically train and learn how to do things to help them with their everyday living abilities. So one of the things that people have when they have Parkinson's is they shuffle. Right. So their, their walking is different. So they come and they learn how to walk with a walking stick to try to make big, bold strides. And it changes their ability to go out and be confident and stop from, you know, well, they're never going to stop from shuffling, but to increase their mobility. To increase their mobility. How do you interact as a fundraiser with the doctors, the researchers, the staff? Well, again, it's all by priorities. We're a huge institution, and so we have a priority list of things that, that um, we're told to go out and talk about. Dr. Spetzler runs the Barrow Neurological Institute, and he decides um, what are the priorities of the institution. So, for instance, Parkinson's is one, ALS is right. another, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, 
Brain Tumor Research Center, which is a big focus of our uh, research efforts. Uh, neuromodulation, which is the study of um, using deep brain stimulation to uh, control bipolar disease, mm -hmm. um, people that have horrible depression and bipolar disease. So he gives us a laundry list. And then on the St. Joe's side of the house, the president of the hospital gives us a list. And then as we're out talking to the people um, that we work with, we, we listen and look for the right fits of projects that they, we think they would be interested. Quite often, they might be in interested that's on nothing that's on the list. And so if we do have something, then we can go back and say, do we have something that would fulfill their wish to make a change in this particular area? And this is a combination of, of research, um, infrastructure that is required, roofs that need replacing, air conditioning units? Not so much roofs that need replacing or air conditioning units. Brand new buildings, uh, new space, libraries for, for women who are going through um, infertility so that they're separate. Um, when they're in the waiting room, they have a separate area that they can read and learn about fertility and don't have to sit out with the mothers with their newborns. Mm -hmm. So capital needs, but not day-to-day uh, -day operational needs. Those are the the responsibility of the institution to pick up. So basically it's research, something, whether it be clinical research or bench science, something that you can take and make a difference from the, from the bench to the bedside. Something will change a new way of giving medicine or practicing medicine as we go forward. How do you organize your fundraising efforts so we have service areas, and we, we divvy those service areas up amongst our development officers. And then they are the resource for that particular service area line. And then when we have our team meetings, we all come back and say, oh, I have a benefactor who is interested in your service area. So you help me work with this person on the right fit. We have a thoracic program, which is lung transplantation, upper GI, et cetera, things like that. So we have uh, one of our people is responsible for that. We have a building, new a new ER out in the West Valley, so somebody will be over that. We have a congenital heart program. So you're mapped to the way the hospital and, and the institute is organized? Correct. Is there a time when you would bring a department head or, or somebody um, working on a particular series of problems? in to meet with your donors? A lot of times, well, the head of our uh, Barrow Neurological Institute is very busy. He performs a lot of surgeries. And so we'll schedule lunches in his office so he can come down after surgery, have lunch, talk about you know, the project that the people are interested in, and then runs back up and continues on. And uh, it's very powerful. So we involve people at um, management, senior management levels all the time. So doctors, administrators, um, who, educators, and, and all so of on. it. Yeah. Could you just describe the scope of, of your staff and their activities? We have a uh, small staff. There's 20 of us, and we manage both foundations, Barrow mm -hmm. and St. Joe's. We raise about 12 million dollars a year. We have five development officers. We have two writers who help with proposals in the magazines and our collateral material. We have four, five support staff. Um, and then we have the back office staff that does the receiving of gifts, the operations, the investments of the funds, managing of the boards, et cetera. And of that 12 million, does that break down roughly in terms of sources into foundations, individual gifts, uh, and so on? We break them down in between annual giving, uh, major gifts, planned gifts, and events. In terms of your overarching strategy, do you develop a five-year plan and then try to fulfill that? Do you have an integrated campaign? Or is it really a year-to-year -year type of planned activity where maybe three, three, four months before the end of the year you start your planning and then you, you, you cycle in? Good question, because we're currently in the middle of our strategic plan. We, we do three years strategic planning uh, that has to be blessed by the board. Okay. And then uh, we look at it annually and review it and, and continue updating it. So you do a three-year plan, and then maybe six months before the expiration of the old three-year plan, you, you develop a new plan? It's more like 12 months. 12 months. Yes, because we involved our boards in it, so we do a SWOT analysis of the market and what the needs of the institution are 
and what our uh, donor base looks like, and then uh, we go forward. So there's lots of meetings that happen, and then it goes up and is blessed by um, the board at Dignity Health, and all is good. Are board members very involved in the fundraising activities themselves? We've gone from more of a serve and wait type board uh, to a board that knows that we exist to raise money and so we've implemented for the Barrow Foundation a give a personal gift and and get at least ten thousand dollars or give ten thousand dollars. So it's a give or get standard that, that you've instituted. Right. And how many board members do you have? There are 24 on the Barrow board and there are 22 on the St. Joe's board. That's very interesting. In terms of, of how the board responsibilities uh, break up, um, all of these boards, if, if I understand you correctly, these boards are for the foundation Correct. of both. So there are separate boards for the institute and for the, uh, for the hospital. And, and are those boards overlapping? No. To a certain extent? They don't overlap. Well, that's interesting. That's so interesting. sometimes a board member from one of the foundation boards will be asked to serve on the community board. Mm -hmm. uh, the community board is not a fiduciary board. The fiduciary board is the Dignity Health Board, which we've just changed our structure. And that's a 12-person board. We do have a representative who used to be on a foundation board that serves on that big board. To me, it's very interesting that people who are going to be involved with the foundation are selecting to be involved on a board where it's not about governance per se, it is about raising that $12 million and more every year. So they're getting on this board to actually make that type of a contribution. So how do you recruit board members? Well, we put the... into place a joint board development committee, so both boards so that we're not overlapping mm -hmm. each other. Uh, we have a committee that vets them. They bring people to the table. We look for diversity within the marketplace. Uh, we look for people that are compassionate about our institution, and then we build it from there. And we have uh, term limits on our board. So the first year is a um, kind of an engagement period. You have a one-year term. If you like us and we like you, then you're asked to serve three three-year terms. So it's a 10-year commitment. Interesting. Interesting. So what is the future of the two foundations going forward? You've just um, had a, a governance change, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's always very interesting. Um, what does the future hold? Future's bright. There's lots of uh, activities, and we're doing great things in, with both research and with patient care. And so I think um, we've got very happy people that would like to share with us. And Phoenix is a strong healthcare center and becoming stronger as, as you move forward. It's, it's, it's really part of the economic future of, of this region of the country. It is. And as we grow, um, we're now the fifth largest uh, state in the country and uh, people get sick. They need a place to go. And these two institutions St. Joseph's and the Barrow Neurological Institute will be there to serve. That's us. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your insights. Thank you.